Hello, and welcome to SPS Unscripted, Personal Journey Episodes. These episodes aim to offer natural flowing monologues, which allow insight into our personal journeys from diagnosis, medications, stem cell transplants, interactions with medical staff, family life, but most importantly, sharing our autobiographical narrative in the hope it helps other Lindsays and M's out there living with a rare disease such as SPS. Today, we listen to Lindsay's personal journey. Good evening, beautiful souls. Here I am again, having my quiet time with uh, the candle in the dark. (laughs) How I spend my evenings, it's beautiful and it's joyful. A time for reflection of all things wonderful today. Um, So I thought I would just sit or lay, actually, as I am cosy up in my bed, and just share a little bit more about me and my SPS journey. So I think what I wanted to be able to touch upon today was uh, my diagnosis journey. And even though within two years I had the label of stiff person syndrome and I am not one for labels. If you were to know me personally, you would know that um, I'm not fond of labels. Um, I don't think they serve us. But when you're in that whirlwind and chaos of um, health challenges and you're searching for answers, trying to figure out what on earth is going on. Uh, a label at that time <laughs> has its purpose. So in the first two years of um, health challenges and the struggles that lay ahead from 2009 to 2011, pre-diagnosis. Quite frankly, I thought I was going out of my mind. Uh, And some doctors implied that. (laughs) Um, I mean, doctors, they are only human. Uh, And, you know, they, they search for a rationalized diagnosis to be able to understand someone's symptoms just as much as, you know, uh, the person who is presenting with these uh, these very um, disturbing and um, somewhat what feels like irrational symptoms, um, you know, and so, so searching for those answers <clears throat> and trying to stay uh, level-headed at the same time, uh, you know, it, it, it's tricky because we are but human and through the strange manifestation of SPS, um, anxiety does uh, come and make itself present because for those of you who have SPS that are listening, it presents like something um, so strange, doesn't it? Um, almost like you can't make sense of it yourself and it's your body that's, that's actually acting out and you're like, but why? Um, for instance, uh, for me, noise, oh, goodness, it's so difficult for me to um, be okay <laughs> with any noise. Um, and those sudden noises, unexpected noises, loud noises, and how my body would respond to to those noises. Um, I mean, it is a standing joke here. We no longer have uh, balloons at birthdays, unless they're, you know, the the helium balloons um, that do not pop, because their anticipation of that pop and what it does um, 
to my physical self, that sudden noise, you know, the hyperexcitability in my brain, my body, central nervous system, how, however you wish to to um, describe it, you know, how it's understood now. But, you know, between 2009 and 2011, you know, it was crazy. Um, you know, and my legs, one minute I'd be standing, the next minute I'd be on the floor. Um, you know, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, CFSME, um, was brought in as a diagnosis um, because of the fatigue element of SPS. And I would physically be crawling up the stairs because my legs were just, as I used to say to my husband, they're just so tired. My legs are too tired. It was, it was, They would not bear my weight. So between stiffness and pain, but also weakness and fatigue, how do you how do you even explain how you can be both at the same time? Um, it was it was so bizarre the presentation. Um, you know the same with my reaction to touch, and sensitivities to uh, noises that are happy as well as, um, you know, really loud bangs or sirens flashing lights, um, you know, and just general day-to-day living noises of my children's laughter or their tears. They were only little. And when I first became, um, you know, as a, an SPS path walker, <laughs> I have a wonderful better way of, of trying to put that. I'm always very mindful of the words that I use. I'm I'm one for thinking we are what we speak. Uh, thoughts become things. You know, what we put out, we get back. So, sharing this, um, it's hard for me because I don't like looking back. But I think for you to get a sense of who I am, the path that I, you know, the path that I've walked and how I got to where I am, um, you know, it's important that I do my best to try and share with you. So along with the chronic fatigue, um, CFS, ME, uh, label and diagnosis, Parkinson's was also brought in to the mix, along with um, Wilson's disease. So the tests that they did with that um, was looking for copper deposits behind the eyes. And actually, if they had found the copper deposits, then I would have been diagnosed with Wilson's disease. But because the copper deposits weren't there, they then labelled stiff person syndrome. And I remember sitting, waiting for that test for, um, for, for my eyes um, to see what was going on there, to see if the, you know, the deposits were there. And I remember saying um, to my husband, I can't do this. I don't know how, I don't know how to do this. And I think um, in another podcast, (laughs) um, I'll discuss with you how I dealt with my diagnosis from 2011 (laughs) um, until, you know, I am where I am today because um, I'm very different now in the way that I think than what I was then. Um, And I think in the respect of that, I mean, I think with love and light instead of fear and sadness. Because that overwhelm back then was huge. And I was terrified. I mean, you know, 
I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I was terrified. And I remember my husband holding my hand and saying, My love, I promise you, you're not going to end up in the way that you think. And I, what he meant by that was I was terrified of losing the complete use of my physical self. It wasn't until a later date that I became terrified of losing my mental capacity. And it's funny, isn't it, as a human, <laughs> um, how, we, how we think of things, how we, um, in, you know, we take in and internalise and try and sift and sort through... Um, an experience that we're out of control of. Because at this time, I was already in a wheelchair. But I was so scared of if it was Parkinson's, what was that going to do to my physical self? So anyway... Um, with that, being sat in the waiting room, waiting to have the checks done to see if they were copper deposits. Um, and my husband and I are having that conversation. Jump forward, the results came back where the deposits weren't there. Um, but I was called in three days after those tests and we were expecting it to be much longer. And then that's when I was pulled into the professor's office, given this label of stiff person syndrome and the name just in itself um I was like I, I don't think I don't think so and I'm there in the wheelchair um I've had a neuro exam um I had all this swelling in the lumbar part of my back that nobody's ever been able to explain it and I'd had blood tests done um, GAD antibodies, which they were um, 2,000 plus. Um, and then along with the diagnostic journey uh, was the EMG, the nerve conduction study. It was only later on that I'd actually had a, then a lumbar puncture and an MRI with the progression after the diagnosis of SPS and not responding to the IVIC, as I had explained in um, another podcast. It was when they, they started questioning then the diagnosis again. Um, so it was the actual professor who had diagnosed me that was actually questioning, okay, are we dealing with, with stiff persons here? Because this woman is not presenting as um, an SPS person would, because it just progressed like it was like a forest fire with, with within me um and these these um these tremors and full body spasms and all these strange manifestations and how sensitive my body had become to where um I was bed bound um and just in and out of spasms constantly and they would last for periods, um, anything from, you know, a few minutes to six hours. Um, and then it got to the point where the spasms were affecting my respiratory system. I was forgetting to breathe. Um, between forgetting to breathe and not being able to breathe because of the crushing. Um, and then I would, you know, there was... The, the, the time that sticks in, in my mind at the moment is when I went into cyanosis. So there was there was a number of emergency calls, um, emergency admissions, you know, ambulances back and forth the house. Um, and with that, 
that the, the, the specific time that I'm thinking of, I was taken to our local hospital who then um, transported me to, um, in, you know, in the, all the blue lights, um, in the ambulance, um, to London, the main hospital there. And we, my husband and I were there for five, six weeks. That's where they did the lumbar puncture um, and confirmed that uh, I was GAD positive in the spinal fluid as well. Um, and that is where they did the first um, plasmapheresis treatment. So that was my first experience with that. Um, And the consultant there, I can see his face now, he then reconfirmed stiff person syndrome. So then I was sent back to Wales uh, to the local hospital. And it was there that I was experiencing more and more and more my body not being able to um, keep my oxygen up to do in spasm it would literally drop into my shoes um and there was a there was a little bit of a discrepancy at the at the hospital where the specialist said I want to see this in your wife he said you know to my husband he said you know her respiratory system will reboot um and my husband tells me this 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 story because um, I was, you know, I, I was away with the fairies um, because he had said that the consultant had watched my oxygen drop and drop and drop and drop. Um, and it, it had gone down um, into 40 something and the consultant panicked. My husband was terrified um, and they couldn't get they couldn't get my my um my oxygen levels back up. So that was a bit of a scary experience, one that obviously I can't remember, um, but very scary for my husband. So from that moment on, um, I was actually told I, I wouldn't be allowed to live outside of a hospital because of what was happening during these spasms. Um, and they don't allow uh, oxygen, at-home oxygen, um, at such high levels. Um, in the community, but I was such a young woman with a young family that my husband fought and fought to get me back home, and it was actually the day before Christmas Eve that he was able to bring me home, but it was on the grounds that there was a hospital bed placed downstairs in our home, that I wasn't allowed upstairs in case the paramedics couldn't get me out from upstairs. Um, because I would go stiff as a board, literally, I mean stiff, and if you tried to bend me, I'd snap. Um, there is something, you know, it, it really is something else when you watch someone in a full SPS spasm. Um, and I know this because I've watched it. <laughs> I've watched it myself from where um, it's been recorded for other consultants to be able to see it. So that was a very strange experience, very overwhelming, very scary, um, thinking I'm never going to be able to go home again, I'm never going to be able to be mum again. Um, but anyway, all the things were sorted out, the meetings were held that needed to be, meet, you know, to be held. Um, my husband attended and, and he fought my corner. He was the greatest, uh, greatest advocate for me. So, yes, I came home, the hospital bed was downstairs, a care package was in place. Um, and then the experience with having a care team in our home, that was difficult. Uh, and my husband and I actually chat about it now, because as I keep saying to you, Someone who presents with SPS, it is so bizarre. And carers coming into the house, I'd never heard of SPS, and it was different carers 
all the time, so my husband, already exhausted by caring for me 24 hours a day and three small children, um, was like, this is just not serving us. It, it, there is no point in this. There is nothing that you can do for her um, that I'm not already doing. It's just causing more upset for um, our family life, our children. Um, and they always came first. Our children always, always came first. Our home was a safe space for them, full of love. Um, and it just breaks my heart to think of how upset they were, even as little as they were. I mean, our eldest daughter, she, um, she experienced this more than anything in the respect of how life changed because she could remember mum before SPS. And then all of these changes, um, it was a lot for her. So, you know, that was the pinnacle of where my life completely changed and my family's life completely changed um, after that trip to London. And because I continued to progress and progress and progress, you know, um, we were searching for a consultant, a care team, um, a doctor, someone that could connect with me and understand me. Um, and my husband and I, we went, you know, from local doctors and consultants in Wales to um, professors in London, different London hospitals. Um, and there was one there, he was amazing. He was, he was a beautiful soul, a beautiful human being. Um, but he actually then gave the support for um, a team in Sheffield and said, you know, um, they are the best. They really are the best for you right now. And he wasn't wrong because um, the care team there, um, two professors in Sheffield, I really do believe I owe my life to. And they were the ones who uh, conducted the stem cell transplant for me that had belief in me, um, that saw me as a human being, as a, as a mum, um, as an individual that was worth, you know, fighting for um, and giving her this opportunity of life. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, and the transplant was in 2017. So I am now five years post-transplant. And living my life every day with gratitude and appreciation for every breath that I take for every smile that I see on my children's faces, for every hug that I have from my husband, for every sunrise and every sunset. And don't get me wrong, <laughs> you know, life isn't easy when SPS is still around, but those full-blown body spasms, the ones that were crushing my respiratory system, you know, they have been dampened. So now I am able to deal with whatever SPS throws at me um, from a stronger, a stronger place. So I think I just wanted to share that with you just to give a little bit of um, a more in-depth uh, view, description of my diagnosis journey, the tests that were done, um, the, the controversy between actually being diagnosed and then, um, the, you know, the same professor second-guessing it because you're just so different 
to what they would regard as um, classic SPS or, you know, someone because they, they, they have to have a criteria, don't they, that, that a person meets for them to be able to label you. And what it was with me is that I filled the box, I met the box, but then I also overspilled the box. So with that, other things were brought in. You know, there was always a question mark uh, with regards to lupus, for instance. Um, so I saw a rheumatologist for a while. Um, and there was all other, you know, things that then came in, you know, the um, the osteopenia, the Raynads, um, the um, the anemia, the you know, all all the all the kind of um, not smaller things, but you know, you kind of have SPS in the middle, and then all these other things going on outside it. Um, because SPS doesn't tend to come on its own. Um, it comes, and then a whole host of other things come along. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's me. That's my diagnosis journey. Um, how I dealt with all of that, I'll share in another podcast um, of A Candle in the Dark. <laughs> and getting to know me. So I am sending this with lots of love, my dear souls. Um, If it's a little bit heavy uh, to listen to, then just, you know, just bypass this particular one. Um, Because this podcast, Unscripted, which is very much, again, what I'm doing now, I am just here chatting away to you uh, with with no script <laughs> but what I'm trying to say here is this podcast with um, with M it is a place of upliftment and joy a safe space where you know that who you're listening to has very much walked the SPS path that, you know, I'm not just spouting things off the top of my head because this journey has also been very real to me. And I know the chaos and the suffering of SPS is very, very real because I've been there and I'm still there. I just look and see and choose to think and feel about this journey of SPS very differently compared to what I did in 2011. So I hope you have had a restful, beautiful, joyful day, and I shall see you soon. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We would love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, SPS Unscripted Podcast. If you would prefer to DM us privately, then do so with the Facebook Messenger app. We're also over on Instagram, SPS Unscripted Podcast One, all one word. A gentle reminder, we are not medical professionals. This content is reflective of personal journeys where we follow advice from our medical teams and we strongly advise that you always consult your medical professional for advice.